Are you a composer who struggles when it comes to mixing your own music? Hi, it's Simon from Composing Academy, and in this video I'll show you eight mixing techniques which you can use when composing cinematic music. I've got this short eight bar phrase here, which I'm going to go through detailing my mixing techniques with. There are of course lots of approaches you can use when mixing, but these are the main ones I use when composing music. Ok, so the first tip isn't actually about mixing, but more about the composing and arranging process. Try to focus most of your time and energy on getting the orchestration and arrangement right first. Mixing can help make a great piece sound even better, but it can't make a mediocre piece sound good. Work on the fine details of the arrangement, so say if your piece feels like it's missing some low end, have a look at how you're using instruments such as the cellos and basses, and see if you can have them play say an octave lower. Or maybe you have a section which has a loud brass chord but it's all sounding a bit muddy? Have a go at maybe taking out the tuba, or orchestrating the chord with just the horns and trumpets. This is another part which I do during the actual composing process. Always aim to be aware of the relative levels of your instruments as you're writing. There's a couple of ways I do this. Firstly, I always make sure I'm using MIDI controllers such as expression and modulation, especially for long sustained sounds such as legato strings. This will not only add life and musical expression to each instrument, but will also help to give a certain degree of volume control compared to the other instruments. Secondly, I often use instrument tracks in Cubase, which gives me a convenient fader for the audio output of each individual instrument, that can quickly be adjusted if needed. You can see here on the mixer for this piece, I have some instruments which I've tweaked the faders for, in order to achieve the balance I want. You can also write in volume automation for the actual instrument channel, but I tend to do that with audio tracks only, so it doesn't clash with any MIDI CC information that I've written in. Also make sure to add a limiter on your master channel to prevent your audio peaking and distorting. EQ is typically used when adjustments to the actual frequency of a sound is needed. You may have a violin sound which is not as bright as you want, so using EQ to subtly boost the higher end frequencies can help to add some extra sparkle. We may have a low bass drum which has a bit too much bottom end, and is mudging the mix, so it needs reining in a little by cutting some of the lowest frequencies. One of the EQ techniques I use the most is cutting out the very lowest frequencies for the mid to high pitched instruments, such as the violins or trumpets. A lot of these instruments have some low end noise or rumble, which although by themselves is okay, when you have multiple instruments led or stacked together, will start to add up, mudging the low end of your mix. You want to be careful to not cut away too much though, as filtering out too much can drastically alter the sound and characteristic of the instrument. Experiment with each instrument individually, by moving the filter slowly up the frequencies, until you hear a slight change in tone. Once you hear that changing of tone, back off a little. Pay careful attention to the low frequency instruments such as cellos and basses, or this boom which I have here. These instruments are critical for the overall low end feel of your track, so try not to cut too much for these. For some instruments, I've also used EQ to boost some frequencies, such as here in the violins where I've boosted at around 2.5k, in order to add some extra brightness. As well as the EQing individual tracks, I often also apply an EQ onto the master fader or channel, which will affect the whole sound of the track. Again, I'll often have a high pass filter rolling off anything below 50Hz, and often a boost to the high frequencies to bring out some of the extra shine to the overall piece. You can see I've also cut slightly at around the 200Hz mark, again in an effort to control any muddiness in the low end which can build up. Although for each instrument, individual EQ changes may be subtle, when you combine all the tracks together, the effect can be a lot more noticeable and effective. Let's take a listen to the section of the short piece, with firstly no EQ, then I'll bring in the EQ for all the tracks, so you can hear the difference. Panning is about giving each instrument or sound its own place in the stereo field. In a typical orchestra, the violins are positioned on the left hand side of the conductor, with the violas just off centre and the cello and basses on the right. The positioning of instruments in an orchestra helps to create a balanced sound, and by making use of panning in your own pieces, 
It will help to give separation and clarity to make each instrument shine through. I almost always follow the typical layout of an orchestra, although I'll usually keep the basses in the middle. As well as the strings, there are of course the brass, woodwinds and percussion sections. French horns are normally positioned on the far left hand side, with the trumpets, trombones and tuba on the right. Woodwinds are normally situated in a row behind the strings and in front of the brass, with the flutes on the left hand side, followed by oboes, clarinets and then the bassoons on the far right hand side. Although I don't have any woodwinds in this piece, you can see I've panned the strings and brass instruments according to their traditional places in the orchestra, apart from the basses as previously mentioned. Let's take a listen to a short snippet with no panning and then with the instruments panned so you can hear the difference. Using reverb is another important technique in mixing, particularly when writing cinematic and orchestral music. Using reverb helps to add a sense of room and space to your music, in turn giving it a greater sense of depth. Imagine playing a cello in a small room versus playing it in a huge cathedral. The sound in the cathedral will bounce around in the form of reflections, helping to give a much richer sound. Most of the sample libraries I've used here have different mic positions and mixes available with the individual reverb of the rooms they were recorded in. To give the illusion that all of these instruments are from the same space, adding an additional reverb over the top can help glue things together. Here I'm using the Spaces reverb from East West as a send effect on most of the orchestral instruments. Let's take a listen to a section without reverb. And now with. Compression is all about reducing the dynamic range of an instrument or track, and can be used for great effect particularly in pop and rock music, helping tracks to sound punchy and more in your face. Be careful when using it with orchestral music though, as dynamics and expressiveness are often at the heart of an orchestral track, and you don't want to squash these too much. I'll admit that I rarely use compression when composing cinematic music, but I do use it more when I'm writing an aggressive and percussion heavy piece. I've only used a compressor on one of the tracks here, the low synth pulsing bass in an effort to make the bass sound a bit more consistent, in turn hopefully making the low end of the track slightly more controlled. Using a reference track can be extremely useful in helping you to compare your mix with that of another track especially if the reference track is professionally mixed by a dedicated mixing engineer. Try and find a track which is in a similar genre and has a similar vibe to the piece you're writing. Then when you're playing back your piece, go back and forth between the reference track and your own music by soloing the reference track. If you bring the track into your DAW, just make sure you don't have any additional effects on your master channel at this stage, which could alter the reference track. This last bonus tip, it's probably not what you'd expect from a video showing you how to mix yourself. But if you are in a position to hire a mixer, say for a particular project, it will most likely pay back dividends for the sonic quality of your music. Most professional composers use dedicated mixing engineers, whether it's Hans Zimmer with Alan Myerson or James Newton Howard with Sean Murphy. As well as using their mixing skills, a mixing engineer would also come with a fresh set of ears. Composers can often be too close to their music to be objective with it, so having someone listen with a new perspective can in itself help to elevate your music. My mixing is certainly nowhere near the standard of a professional mixing engineer. So if you are in a position where you're working on a project and there's some extra budget to hire a mixer, I would absolutely recommend this. Check out the contact details below for an awesome mixing engineer called Gary Platts, who's worked on a variety of projects which are streaming on both Netflix and Amazon Prime. And finally, let's take a listen to the piece with all of the mixing techniques combined.
there's a few tips you can use to get started with mixing your music. Whether you're recording with actual musicians or just using samples, making sure you have some degree of mixing in your track is essential to help your music reach its true potential. As always, if you've enjoyed the video, please don't forget to press the like button and subscribe to the channel for more composing tutorials and tips and tricks. Thank you.